Lloyd, this is your second stint as as commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection. I'm wondering if there, uh, if, if anything has changed since you've left. Um, you know, whether it's uh, from how the agency is run or just from a policy perspective. What what have you kind of taken away since you've come back? Well, I think there's one very big difference that's that's readily um, apparent is that when I was last here we were just starting to roll out what's called automated meter reading or AMR. Um, Ten years ago when we wanted to know how much water someone had used we had to knock on a door, get access, go down to the basement, read the meter um, every time and as a result of that frequently because people wouldn't be home people had estimated bills and that could go on for months and months and then when they got a bill if it was more than they had thought it was going to be, neither they nor we could really reconstruct why that had happened. Now, with automated meter reading, we're getting that information about water use on a continuous basis, as is the customer. They can sign on to my DEP account, or now we have a new mobile app, and they can see how they're using their water almost real time. That means that the bills aren't estimated, and if there's any concern about what happened, they can look at it. We had one customer who called up and said, I had this huge spike in November, what went on? And we went and looked, and we said, well, it was the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, and he said, oh, Thanksgiving, my kids and grandchildren were here, and they were doing laundry all day, no wonder. So it really makes it much easier, it builds a much better relationship between us and customers, because we both can look at what's going on and have the real facts. Then there are two things that we've introduced uh, just this year that are also, I think, really customer service pluses that we hadn't been able to do before. Um, one is that we have introduced something called the Home Water Assistance Program, where low-income homeowners can get a credit against their annual water bill um, if they get uh, if they qualify for that because of their income. The other thing is for the first time we've frozen the minimum rate. Some people, uh, particularly as they get older and they're empty nesters, they go on to a minimum rate because they're not using that much water. This year we froze that, so that means 25 percent of homeowners, many of them elderly, didn't get any water rate increase this year. Now, in terms of the environmental challenges, um, have, have there, are there new challenges that you have to be concerned about now in your second stint as, as DEP commissioner, whether it be you know, keeping water clean or, or any other things around climate change or, or our protection of our coastline? Well, it's interesting because, of course, climate change is not only happening, but it's accelerating a little more than we had all anticipated. One of the things that the city's been doing over the past 20 or 30 years is really opening up the waterfront again. And that's a great amenity for people for both passive and active use. Um, and we're able to do that because water quality is improving. The water quality is now better than it's been for the past 100 years in the harbor. But we are also coping with increased rainfall in New York City. Um, it's a constant, it's frequent, they're microbursts. And that means that even though we have invested something like $20 billion over the past 10 years to improve the water quality in the harbor, um, at the same time we're coping with these increased uh, amounts of stormwater. So we're doing a lot of things to try to deal with and stay ahead of that. One is we are continuing to invest in what we call gray infrastructure. That's pipes and pumps and tanks and treatment facilities. But one of the real innovations is what we call green infrastructure. And that means we try to intercept the stormwater where it comes down. And lots of people are starting to see there in the, these in their neighborhoods. The most typical thing we do is called a bias whale. And that really just looks like an enormous and lushly planted tree pit, usually on the sidewalk. That captures the stormwater right where it comes down before it gets into the sewer system um, and can become a combined sewer overflow if it overwhelms the capacity of the sewer. Right, and actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because the combined sewer sewage overflow and, and kind of the aging water infrastructure is something you hear a lot from environmental advocates as a big concern. So can you talk to me a little bit about what you're doing to kind of, I guess, upgrade that infrastructure that's been here, obviously, for over 100 years yeah. now? Yeah, and we do have very extensive infrastructure, obviously, in the five boroughs and 100, 125 miles all the way up to the watershed, and a lot of it is very old. Um, we're just completing Water Tunnel 3, which will allow us to take 
water tunnel one offline and inspect and repair it for the first time since 1917, which is pretty astonishing. We're very fortunate that it is, was built so well that it's um, really kept going. But we are continuing to invest all the time in keeping the water and wastewater infrastructure um, in a state of, of good repair. And with climate change, that's even more of a challenge. Um, one of the things that we are hoping may change a little bit um, is that years ago when the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act were, were first passed, there was federal money to help cities maintain and upgrade their water and wastewater systems. And we're hoping the federal government uh, will start to help us again as we deal with climate change, because right now all of this enormously um, large investment in our infrastructure comes from our ratepayers. They pay every penny of what goes into this work. Sure. Now, I want to ask you a little bit about there was obviously a crisis in Toledo, Ohio, around the, the drinking water. Would something like that, could, is there a concern that something like that could happen in New York City? And if so, how would that be managed? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, that was from toxic algae in Lake Erie, and it was caused by runoff from farms, from cattle manure, and from leaking uh, wastewater systems around Lake Erie. Um, fortunately, we have been working on this for the past 20 years in our upstate watershed. Um, we have upgraded over 100 wastewater treatment plants upstate. We've upgraded over 500, over five, I'm sorry, We've upgraded over 5,000 uh, septic systems individually owned in the watershed, um, and we have installed more than 6,000 projects on farms to contain runoff so that runoff from the farms, exactly like what caused the problem in Toledo, doesn't get into the streams and rivers that go into our reservoirs. And also, we uh, the other thing I'd like to add is that um, just to be sure, we test the water continuously um, from the time it is in the reservoirs all the way down till it goes into your home. Uh, we have in the city more than a thousand test locations uh, right on people's streets. You probably see those silver boxes. People sure. always wonder what those are. Uh, people, we go out and we take water samples and we test it throughout the city to make sure that it's uh, high quality. That's very comforting. <laughs> um, now, I want to ask you about some of the uh, the waste to energy initiatives that were obviously a, a big hallmark of the previous administration. Yeah. Do you plan to expand that even further? Yeah, we do. Uh, we started a pilot um, last summer at the Newtown Creek Wastewater Facility with the Department of Sanitation and Waste Management to take some of the food waste that sanitation is now collecting and to put it into those big egg digesters. And the digester works like a big stomach. Mm. It takes the organics and it breaks them down into carbon dioxide, water, and methane. If it was in your body, it would turn into energy. Uh, but there, it, it gets broken down into those components. Right now, we use about 40% of that methane uh, to power that plant, but about 60% we flare so it won't go into the atmosphere as fugitive methane. What we are going to do with National Grid is capture the rest of that methane. They clean it up so that it becomes natural gas, which is really what methane is, and they are going to be putting that right into distribution. We plan to keep expanding that program over the next three years uh, to see how it goes, and then we hope to keep building on that in the future. Now, I also wanted to ask you about a little bit of news today from DEP that um, there are plans to build a hydroelectric facility right. to harness clean, renewable energy. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that and what this means for the kind of waste to energy type, yeah. type of thing? That we, we're, about? we're very excited about that. Um, we have 19 reservoirs and controlled lakes. Um, and, of course, reservoirs uh, frequently have spilling water that can be captured for energy. Um, because our dams were not built primarily for hydroelectric use, it means we have to find the right dams to use because we sometimes have to regulate how much water is released when. We have commitments to downstate users. We have commitments to environmentalists who want to maintain uh, the ecosystem for wildlife downstream. But at this particular dam, and at four others, we are able to capture it in a way that can be used for a steady stream of hydroelectric power. So we are building that plant now and adding it to four others that are at four of our other dams. This was the best one. We looked at all of them, but there are other possibilities in the future. 
Then in addition, we are also installing solar panels at one of our wastewater treatment plants in New York City. Um, and of course, we do hope to increase the methane use, not just at Newtown Creek, but to capture it at more of our plants to power those plants. So we have a lot of things going on to try to get us to that 30% reduction by 2030. Interesting. Now, I want to just finish up by asking, you've been in government for a long time, obviously, not just, right, so, and, and not just your previous stint, but also um, under under the Dinkins administration as well. But you've also now had some time in the private sector. I'm curious, what brought you back to government after some, some time away? And do you foresee yourself kind of staying in, in, in government for, for the long term? Or do you kind of like, you know, taking a break from time to time? Well, I have taken a few breaks, but uh, <laughs> I love working in local government. Um, I think you have an, an enormous capacity to really help people's day-to-day -day lives. Uh, it's at that level, and you also have face-to-face -face interaction. Even in a big city, uh, your service delivery is really quite personal uh, with people, and I think that level of accountability uh, makes for uh, a very responsive kind of government. I think that uh, one of the things I learned from being in the private sector uh, where you're very price sensitive all the time is to really think about how we deliver our service in a price sensitive way. Uh, we don't think of ourselves as, oh, the tax money comes in, we put the product out. And the, particularly because what we do is paid for by our ratepayers, it makes us very, very sensitive all the time to our costs. And we are continuously going through. On the one hand, we have to invest a lot in big infrastructure. But on the other hand, we're always trying to go back around and see if we can deliver that product uh, more cost effectively for our ratepayers. And I think that's been very helpful. Emily Lloyd, Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.